Yeah, since he... All right. Welcome, everyone. Glad you're here today. Uh, we have a great program lined up for you. Just a couple of tips for Zoom. Uh, one, please mute yourself if you're not talking. Uh, number two, use the chat function. Uh, it's a great opportunity to really chat with other people that are in the meeting. And number three is if you do not have your video on, please go ahead and turn it on. We are also streaming live on YouTube. So far, we have a grand participant of four people watching so far, but uh, it's streaming live and you can also chat over there, but it will not record your video. You will not be shown on the screen unless your video is on. So please go ahead and do that. When you get your email every week, you'll have two choices. You can either click on for the Zoom meeting or you can click on for the YouTube meeting, or you can do like, um, a couple of us are and have a screen going for Zoom and a screen going for YouTube. So hopefully you'll you'll do that and check in. Well, it is the time again for that exciting round two of the joke contest. Uh, this week, Mr. Dryman lost on the coin toss, so he will be going first. Um, Having heard some of his jokes last night at the uh, social event that we had online, well, let's just say you're in for something. I'm not really quite sure what, but Mr. Dryman, lead us off with your best joke. Well, I had it narrowed down to one of three and I did a coin flip and this is the one that uh, took it. So I wanna die peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather did not screaming in terror like my passengers in his car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead and tell your joke, Paul. Yeah, really, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Massey, before we launch the poll, give us your best shot. Uh, Dave, I'm reading a book about anti-gravity. It's impossible to put down. Oh, wow. Okay. Really? Really? And I lost last week? <laughs> Is there yeah, a third really. It makes you, don't you want to get back in, Ian? Okay, launching the poll. You've got about 30 seconds. Vote for the winner who will move on. Unfortunately, we don't have a choice of, no, of neither one, so you have to vote for one. <laughs> Is there a write-in category? <laughs> I'm abstaining. <laughs> All right. I refuse to participate in these shenanigans. Wow, it looks like it's a pretty close contest. We're going to give it 10 more seconds. It's neck and neck. Whoa, five, four. I don't see the contest. Two, one. Okay, that is the end of the poll. Let's see what the results are. Let's see who is moving on to next week. Wow, Mr. Dryman is moving on to the next round. Way to go, Paul. <laughs> David was dethroned. Wow, good job. All right, so Very close. we'll take that off and we'll turn it over to Carol, who will give us the introduction of guests for the day. I believe I've only seen one guest and that's Mike Hebert, who's become such a familiar face now, maybe not a guest, but we're always happy to see you check in, Mike. Are there Thank any you. others I haven't spotted? I feel I'm here so much you should bill me. We will. You're on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Done. I'm happy to do so. I have it recorded. All right. Thank you, Carol. Let's go to inspirational moment and pledge with uh, Heather. Okay, so I chose a short inspirational moment, but I think it's a really good one. Um, something that I, I try and look at from time to time. It's by John Wooden. Never try to be better than someone else. Always learn from others and try to be the best that you can be. Success is the byproduct of that preparation. That's John Wooden. And now for the pledge. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. All thank right. Thank you much. Thank you much. Uh, let's go to our song, and today we are going to do a video, and hopefully it will play, actually, uh, with the uh, bandwidth that we have. So here we go. I will share this in one moment. No audio there, Dave. Well, there you go. The uh, the video is not enough bandwidth, so that was a short song today. Sorry about that. You uh, let's go to us, Dave. What's that? You could sing for us. I yeah. could, but then Dave, what, what, the, the 48 participants would be down to five within about 20 seconds. So, <laughs> all right, let's go to uh, the um, fine session with KT. All right, now the RI president, Holger Knack, if those of you who read the bulletin saw it, the letter from him. He says that we need to embrace change. And he quotes Paul Harris, who says embracing change will strengthen us. So the question is, what kind of change? So I thought, well, what we need to do is look, at this, look to the stars and we look to the constellations. And that's why the advice we're going to get is from the horoscope but we need to know who's in the horoscope. So Jason Corey, are you there? Yep, are you I'm muted? Here. Yeah. Okay, Jason. Now we have a, a consolation and, and you're gonna be only charged if you lose $10, if you don't lose Twenty dollars, because I haven't seen Bob's list of how much money people give in. So, cancer is the crab, and we have a member who has a birthday in that period. Is it Neil? Is it Kara? Or is it Hyder? I didn't read the last. Update, unfortunately. Usually I look at the birth dates. Uh, I'll go with Hater. Oh, that's too bad. So you get $20 fine. Kara on July 20th is the one we're talking about. So the advice she would be given. Happy belated. Said, pardon me? Happy belated birthday to Kara. Yeah. And uh, if she. Uh, once the advice, here it is. Generally, most people feel automatically sure of what is reality. Therefore, to question your automatic responses is always an act of growth. So that's some advice they give us. Okay, the next one, um, Adam, are you there? I am here. Good. Okay, Leo is the lion up there. Now, who is within that period of constellations? Is it David Massey, Mike Magison, or Andrea McClellan? There's only one lion in that group. It's got to be Andrea. Oh, that's too bad again. <laughs> We're making a lot of money today. Uh, $20. It's David Massey. And what kind of advice do the stars give you, David? Here you go. It will occur to you that an area you focused on seems devoid of juice. Move on. There are other things to squeeze. <laughs> so you owe me one, David. 
OK, Virgo is the maiden. Uh, Nate, are you there? Mate, Nate, are you yes. there? Yes, I am. OK. <laughs> are you all there? <laughs> <laughs> is it Judy St. John under this period from August through September? Is it Sharon or is it Rich? I say Rich. My gosh, you're brilliant. It is Rich. His birthday is September 17. And here's his advice, the advice to him from the stars. Reciprocal giving has its time and place. However, right now it's better to accept someone's care and then pay it forward to another. So that's pretty cool. It is. Okay, thank you. So you 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 only owe ten dollars, Nate. Uh, Kyle, are you still here? Yes. Okay, good. All right, we've got Libra, which is the scales. And is this Dennis Wilson that's in this period? Ken Warner or Carol Robinson? I'm gonna go with Carol. Oh, poor Ken. Ken is the one. And he's September 28th. So his is coming up soon. Well, in two months. And here's, here's the advice. You're safe to let whimsy have its rule. You can access what's possible later. Right now, let your imagination soar. How cool is that? All right, um, Bob Lewis, I'm asking you because you made me do this. <laughs> there you are. Are you there? <laughs> okay. okay, under Scorpio, who's a scorpion? Who is it? Is it uh, Paul Dryman, Norm Nagel, or Deborah Kniss? I'm going to go with Norm. Oh, that's too bad. It's uh, Paul Dryman, <laughs> as you probably gathered today. Almost doesn't count. <laughs> and Paul, here's your advice. You will be attracted to a subject appreciated by many and understood by few. You will learn how you are uniquely equipped to be among those few should you choose to devote focus to it. Pretty good advice. All right, we've got Sagittarius. Um, Jessica, are you here? Yes, I am, I'm here. Okay. Who do you think uh, is under the Sagittarius sign? Is it Lee Ladd, Felix Massey, or Nancy Wall? I think Felix. Oh, too bad. Oh, it's Nancy. Her that was my second choice. November, two days after Thanksgiving this year. So here's the advice, Nancy, to stay on track. You have to consciously and constantly put your values up front. A ritual can help. And we know you know how to do that. Okay, the last one, Capricorn. Um, Herb, do you want to try? <laughs> or you're not still here? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. And that's an easy one. Capricorn has got to be. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. How about um, Susan Morata? Oh, you are so brilliant. It is. Well, and so <laughs> <he's> <laughs> Susan, here's your advice. Don't fight against problems. Sink to the bottom of a problem as if it were a swimming pool. It won't take much to bounce off the bottom with your toes and resurface to a cleansing breath. How's that? Yeah. So a happy birthday to all those people when it comes around. And today, happy Thursday to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, KT. Appreciate that. That was great. Uh, let's go to uh, 
the master of fun, our own Pat McCoy. Where is Pat? I'm here. Can you hear there me? He, yes, you're good. Okay. All right. We've uh, we had I'm some ready. some poker chips donated to us from a Rotarian whose name I'll leave unknown Hope for you can now. See them. <laughs> and I'll have Vanna here reach in and grab a chip. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I mean, Hello, Vanna. You know what? She just got here. At first, I thought I was going to say she had to take a hike. And she literally just got back from Wildwood. That's why she's got that, that hat on. Okay, today's winner is? Okay, Aline. Whoop, Pat, you're, you're muted. It's, it's Aline Roberts, and she's not here. Oh, wow. We are rolling over to another week. <laughs> I know. I think we're up to 15 bucks now. 15 bucks. Woo 15 bucks. You can definitely get a happy meal for $15 now. So <laughs> next right. week, maybe we'll get a winner. Next week. Get a winner chicken dinner. We have not had one yet. All right. Thank you, Pat and Dana. <laughs> All right. All right. That's great. We're going to go to announcements now. Uh, first off, I would really like to say hello to Mr. Dave Frieda. We are glad to have you back in the house. That's fantastic. So welcome back. And we are particularly glad to see our past president, Herb, back online and back in the group. So Herb, I'm sure you would like to just say hello. So welcome. We're so happy to see you in the group again. Thank, thank you, Dave. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the uh, cards and calls and all sorts of stuff that uh, several members have sent. Um, it really does mean a lot. And I'm hoping I am have turned a corner. I'm going to start to get better. I'll be <clears throat> up and uh, dancing very slowly. Uh, I am hoping in another couple of weeks, but this is really the first chance I've had to be able to actually get up in front of a computer screen and all that. And so I'm delighted. Um, you know, thanks so much to Karen and, and Dave for finishing up my year for me. And uh, you'll hear more from me because we'll have a little bit of time to, so I can express some thanks to those that have been so good and finishing up the year and you know i'm absolutely delighted things are going well and uh, you know after eight weeks get me out of here get me out of here <laughs> thanks again all Bye. right herb great to see you all right we have a couple of uh, other announcements i'm going to turn it over to ian right now to um give us some uh i think he has some awards to hand out i uh, i do we have um, a number of people that have um, been generous enough to uh, become Paul Harris fellows. And we have um, uh, some uh, major donors as well, which the major donors will be announced when the district governor um, attends the meeting. But um, as you all know, and I'll repeat anyone, so I apologize, or if I'm repeating, what stuff you already know, I apologize, but a Paul Harris um, fellow is someone or the award goes to someone who has donated a thousand dollars to uh, to uh, Rotary International. And with that being said, let's just get underway. So Paul Harris plus ones, we have Kyle Lundberg, Michael Teasdale and Fred Lindbergh. So well done. Your pins will be mailed to you. We have uh, Paul Harris plus two, Maria Prescott and Crystal Doyle. Well done, you guys. And then plus three, we have Mike Jansen and Mark Sellers. So very generous, awesome. Thank you all very much. And your pins will be mailed to you. And the remaining um, awards will be given out when the district governor comes uh, at the toward the end of uh, next month. So make sure you attend the meeting so you can either claim your award or get to see who it is. 
Great, thank you, Ian. And thanks to all those who uh, participate through Paul Harris Fellow. That is a very significant uh, thing for our club. It, it makes a world of difference when you fund these kinds of uh, activities. And uh, so thank you for your generosity. Uh, well deserved. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dave Massey, who has a couple uh, of announcements. So Dave. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, <clears throat> so one of the one of the huge challenges, I'm the director of community service this year. And as you can guess, the traditional things that we do in community service, which is both our fundraising uh, through street fair, the wine fest and the uh, chili cook off have all been um, wiped out by COVID uh, this year, th these years. And so we're really trying to be creative in what we can do in, in that. But there's also things that we do in the way of the blood drive and the military shows and stuff that we're getting out as Rotarians and doing things for the community and that's also limited. So what we've been trying to do as a board is to be more creative in ways that we can help our community because they need help. And that we can also be active as people, as Rotarians, because just sitting at home in our world doesn't let us be the people of action that Rotarians are. So I wanted to give you a couple of projects that we're doing as a club that you can be involved with, how you can get involved and acknowledging some people that have already been involved with this. And so I'm gonna give you guys a, a PowerPoint right now, pardon me for a second while I bring this up, but we've got four areas that we are uh, doing uh, the, uh, uh, that we've got stuff to do in and, Hold on a second here. Thank you. Okay, so this is the question here: is how can we help during uh, during COVID? Um, and and so we've got to be able to find a way to be doing it safely for all those people involved. So here's the four projects we've kind of got going right now. We've got a baby gear project. We're working with senior concerns. We've got eBay auctions, and our one of our big projects here, which is the James Story House. Let me start off with the baby gear. What we're doing is helping out the Ventura County Rescue Mission. They have a project called the Lighthouse Project that deals with mothers who are out of their homes uh, that are in transition right now. There's often women that are that have the, the, the substance abuse may be there or physical violence might be there by a partner and they and their kids don't have much. And so Jessica Sawyer, who has been Sawyer Rubenstein, has been wonderful, brought this project to us. And what we're doing, what she's done, and what we're looking for to expand with the rest of the club is that she has friends that are uh, that have baby gear, uh, cribs, strollers, uh, all things that uh, we call them big plastic things. Uh, when I had young children, well, they're not; these people aren't using them anymore, but they wanted this to go to somebody, and so these are actually going. We're taking these gears that are that, that are in good condition and giving them directly to mothers who have young children so that they can have these items to care for their kids. This isn't going to a, uh, a store to be sold for the charity. It's going directly to this. So one, thank you, Jessica, so much for bringing this project to us. Um, how can you help? All right. Well, first off, uh, Jessica was driving all over uh, the, the Caneo Valley to pick up items uh, that people who said that they were willing to donate. These were individuals that were just part of her Facebook group that were willing to provide items and she was doing all the driving. So it's helping her pick these items up from people and then ultimately deliver them over to the rescue mission. Uh, and um, so we kind of need people to help pick up and, and, and help drivers help maybe store that stuff for a little while and then get it over the rescue mission. Uh, this is a shot of Jessica and uh, the woman from the rescue mission, her husband. This is not what Jessica's garage typically looks like, I am told. This is after it was filled up with all kinds of gear that was then delivered. So um, uh, we really appreciate the help that you guys can give in this. And uh, in, in any of these projects, contact me or the person that I'm mentioning that is kind of heading it and let's get you involved. The next one is I sent an email out for senior concerns. Um, the senior concerns needs be drivers for Meals on Wheels. And many of you have already been doing this. Just a couple of people that told me they'd been doing it was Lee Ladd and Tanya and Michelle and Darren's daughter signed up to do this. So this is just delivering meals uh, on, a, on a weekly basis out to seniors. You pick the day, uh, there's, a time, there's a couple of time frames you can do it in. 
You have to pass a security check uh, just to make sure that Senior Concerns knows good people are doing it. And then this is an opportunity for you to do it. Let them know that you're from Thousand Oaks Rotary and you're doing it, but it's a great way to help out those seniors. So go to, go to the Senior Concerns website, sign up with them. Let's let Rotary, let's have Rotary have a big impact on those on those seniors. The second one that we're doing is uh, we want to have a collection that seniors really need for these isolated seniors. They have non-perishable items that they need to that they're low on that they don't get. And so what I want to do is how can we help? Well, I'd like to see our club and I'll send a list out for this. Sharon Russell is doing this. She needs a couple people to help her on her committee. So I'm looking for people who can help Sharon and that I'm looking for people who are willing to donate the items and I'll send it, we'll send a list out. Sharon will send a list out of all those items uh, or if they wanna make a cash donation, that's fine. Uh, and then we wanna collect these items up and bring them over to Senior Concerns and let the scene, them know this is from Thousand Oaks Rotary to help out those seniors that just aren't able to get the type of non-perishable items, cleaning stuff that, that they need. So, all right, the next project is one that, that fundraising is so challenging right now because we can't do events that are in-person. And that is our three main fundraisers were all about in-person. So I was cleaning my garage out. And I thought this is a good way I, we, my wife and I were getting rid of stuff and we were selling it on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. And this was a good way for us to kind of get rid of some of the stuff that was in our garage. And I thought this is a good fundraiser for Rotary. So um, I don't want to limit it. I'm calling it eBay auctions, but I don't want to limit it to just eBay. Um, uh, I've got Monica and Karen Fernari that are, are working on this, but I'd like some other people. If you've ever been done, if you've bought on Craigslist or, or bought on Facebook Marketplace or the Next Door Neighbor app, think about that. We've got members that are willing to donate stuff. Uh, some of the larger items probably need to be sold locally, but the, what we want to do is have all our proceeds go back to the club so that we can give directly to charities. So what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking up for people to uh, to help sell stuff and to help collect things uh, for other uh, for the individuals. We want items of value. This is not your chance to get rid of small items in a garage sale type of thing. But we need to. We've had many people that have been interested in giving. I need some people to step up and help with this. If we spread the work out a little bit, this will be a, a good fundraiser. We may raise a couple of thousand bucks from doing this. Right now, we're not raising a lot. So let's find a way that we can do this in a safe environment. The last one, I'm just going to premiere a little bit here because we're going to have a bigger presentation on this. The James Storehouse that deals with foster kids in Ventura County. We've there's a we've done a, Michael Jensen and his group for the International Committee has done a huge grant for about 19k. And what we're going to be doing <clears throat> is that we're going to be helping these kids that have been in foster transition into adulthood by helping them set up their apartments. We've got money to buy uh, uh, furniture and items for them. We've got uh, money to, to get kitchen and bathroom kits for them. So we're helping them set up into adulthood with physical items and we've got money set aside. We need people to help purchase those items. Deborah Kinn is, is the one that's leading this. Uh, we're gonna make a bigger presentation later. But the other thing we're also gonna do is potentially have a mentoring program that we can help some of these uh, foster kids that are transitioning into adulthood, be able to guide them and get the advice that parents typically would have given, but help them in areas of finance, housing, um, if, it's, if there's any sort of kind of legal aspects, things to help them make good decisions as they move forward in their lives. So these are the areas that we're gonna be kind of working on when it comes to community service. They're not our traditional areas, but they're helping our community. And so if any of these interest you at any particular level, let me know or the people who are in charge of that committee. And we would, I would absolutely love to do that because as Rotarians, we need to get out and do things. We need to serve our community. That's us. And the reward of even doing just a little is so much. So I encourage you to get involved. Let me know how I can help you get involved. And thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, appreciate your leadership in uh, working on that. Uh, and thanks to Jessica and Sharon and Monica. Karen is involved, Deborah for really uh, taking a leadership role in all those projects and 
making a difference in our community. Uh, this is the year we're going to be and have to be creative. So we are open to all ideas and all ways that we can reach out and serve our local community. As all of you know, because you're very involved in the community, we've got a lot of people hurting in our community. And this is where Rotary steps into the gap and really makes a difference in the lives of people. And these are just four projects that can really, with some very simple steps and a little bit of time, make a huge difference for a lot of people in our community. So thanks to all those that are involved and for your continuing efforts. Uh, next, we're going to go to a new item, um, and I'm going to have Susan come up here in just a second and talk, but we, uh, one of the ways that we're looking to, to raise some funds for the annual fund share um, is to do our online auction here at our club of, of items. So uh, Chair, uh, Susan is going to talk a little bit about this, but this is money that we want to raise for the Rotary Foundation annual fund share. And that, that fund is the primary focus of funding for just a broad range of the local and international Rotary Foundation activities. So you say, well, why is that important to us? Why, why should we care about that? Seems so remote, seems so far away. Well, through the share system, the money that's contributed to the annual fund is literally shared with Rotary clubs like ours and to our District 5240. And quite frankly, I mean, it's the lifeblood of what we do and we could not accomplish half of what we do as a club without the annual fund share program at Rotary International Foundation. So why is that? Why, why, what is, how does that work? Well, at the end of every Rotary year, contributions to the annual fund from all clubs in our district which is 5240, are directed into two separate international funds. One, 50% of that money goes to the World Fund, and 50% of the money goes to district-designated funds. And this is really critical to all of our clubs, particularly mm -hmm. ours, for three very important reasons. First of all, the RI World Fund, a portion of these monies pay for our global grants. Now, so when you purchase a Paul Harris Fellow, as Ian was talking about earlier, you typically will put in 600, our club puts in 500, and you're credited with $1,000 to the Rotary International Foundation. And that money coming from the World Fund is given to our district 5240. Our district then takes that money and puts it into our club and into our other projects. So we, we leverage the money several times over. It allows us to fund these projects such as the hearing aid project in Mexico, the planetarium for the kids in Tijuana, you know, healthcare to the impoverished in India. It provided a free dental clinic here in our own local community when we were the first club in our district to ever write a reversed global grant. So that money, for every dollar we put in, I mean, we probably get back three, four, five dollars, which means that we can do projects that we could never do on our own just as a club. The second important component of that is the district designated fund. So RI takes that money that we each give to the, to the annual fund every year, and 50% of that goes to our district and every other district in the world. And then our, then our district, matches us dollar for dollar on money that our club puts in on these district designated grants. So this year, the James Storehouse project, for example, the, the district is paying us every dollar for every dollar we put into that project. So it's doubling our money in, in a short period of time. There's no investment, I don't think, that you could ever get that kind of return. So what does that allow us to do? Well, it, we put project money into senior concerns. We put it into Conejo Hospice. We're doing it for the James Storehouse program and just many, many local projects. Again, that is critical for us because it's really allowing us to leverage every dollar that all of you put into the annual fund every year. And the third thing is these, it's based on an average. So every three years, the money is average. So the more money we put into the annual fund, the more money we get back. And our club for the last 
several years, I'm proud to say has been the number one recipient of the district designated fund allocation coming from our district. And that's because of your generosity, because you see the value of making a contribution to Rotary International and seeing that money come back into our community for projects that we can now help to our, all the local groups that we support throughout our community. So this program that um, Susan's gonna talk about in a minute is one of the ways that we're going to help fund the annual fund share to make sure that we're getting more money back from our district. We wanna stay number one because it makes a huge difference to our community. So when Ian comes to you soon and he says, I want you to be a participant of every Rotarian every year. Know that this is the fundraising effort that's designed to encourage each of us to support Rotary International's foundation annual fund. So whatever level you can participate, whether that's a dollar or whether that's a thousand dollars or somewhere in between, it makes a huge difference. You double, triple our money on projects that we do in our community. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan to explain a little bit how the auction works and let's have a little bit of fun. So Susan. Thanks, David. Um, okay, so this is different than um, what we're doing with selling products on eBay and that type of thing. Um, the, the eBay project is, you know, you're cleaning out your garage and you're getting rid of some things. What we want you to do um, on this, we're asking Rotarians to donate an item that periodically we will do these online auctions. Um, today, we just have um, one item which was donated by our president, David. I'm not going to butcher this, uh, the name of this one. Um, it's a French wine, it's a 2012. And let me just read a couple of things um, that the winemaker uh, talks about this wine. A medium ruby red color. The elegant bouquet opens with notes of wild roses, plums, and a variety of red fruits, underlined by intriguing scents of sandalwood, myrrh, and delicate hints of clove. Full-bodied, yet delicate and round with a fresh acidity and savory finish that lingers on the palate. I don't know about you, but my mouth is watering right now. They say this wine is produced only in the very best years when the climate brings optimum, optimum growing condition to the vines, permitting the grapes to express all the complexity of the land. So I don't know if you're a, a wine connoisseur or not, um, but this is your opportunity, if you're not, to try an incredible bottle of wine. And while you're doing that, we are raising money to go to the annual fund. So uh, like I said, this is the first item I'll be reaching out to people to see if you have something else you'd like to donate that we can auction next time. Maybe your favorite restaurant. Maybe when things open up again and we have a you know, shows at the Civic Arts Plaza, we can auction off tickets and that type of thing. And all of the money is going to this annual fund, which eventually comes right back to our club so we can do so many good things in this community. So that being said, um, you know, if you're gonna, I know my husband and I are making steaks this Friday, we're gonna broil some steaks. This wine would go fabulous with that. So let's start the bidding. We're gonna do this by voice, so you'll have to unmute yourself. I was gonna try to do it by the chat screen, but I think it'll be funner if we try to do this live. If you'd like to bid, unmute yourself. I'll recognize the first person I see, and hey, then Susan, we'll move on. I have a question. Yes. Are you offering to barbecue us steaks with this bottle of wine on Friday? Oh, no, no, oh. <laughs> heavens no. But I'm just saying it's a, fa it's a fabulous bottle of wine. And it's, um, like I said, my mouth was watering when I was reading this. So it retails for $95. So let's start the bidding at $30. Do I have a bid for $30 for this fabulous bottle of wine? Just I'll, unmute I'll yourself. I'll bid 30. Yes. Okay, Kyle. 50. 
Oh, who's that? KT has 50. KT this is, $50. This is Chris, 75. Chris, let's see you're doing all my work for me. We have a bit of <laughs> 75 for this fa fabulous bottle. Do I hear 80? We have a bit of $75. Do I hear $80? I'll, I'll do 80. Kyle, Kyle, 80. <laughs> awesome. It's, that's a bargain. That's a bargain. And remember, you're not just getting the bottle of wine. You are donating to the annual fund at the same time. So it's going to a good cause. So we have a bit of 80. Do I hear 90? Yes. 90. Oh, KT, 80. bless your heart. KT, $90. We have okay, a Chris says 100. Oh, Chris Steele. You're 101. You're oh. <laughs> 101. Do we have a, a higher bid? 105. 105. We have a bit of $101 from KT Connor. Do I hear a bit of 105 going to the annual fund? It's coming back to this club. Um, I'll make it 105. Oh. <laughs> you outbid yourself, KT. <laughs> we have a bit of 105. Do we have 110? I'll do 110. Oh, Kyle. Oh, Nian, Ian, I'm sorry, Ian. But Kyle can pay for it, but I'll drink it. <laughs> Ian, bless your heart. 110. You're a smart man. Okay, can you can you bring it when I come to your office? Sure. <laughs> I'll have everyone gargle with it before. We have a bid from Ian for 110. Do I hear 115? We have a bid from Ian for 110. Do I hear 115? 115. Okay, T, you're such a sweetie. Would you tell Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> We have a bid from KT Connor for $115 going right to the annual fund, and she's getting a kick butt bottle of wine. Um, $115. Do I hear $120? I'll do $120. Oh, my goodness. All right. Ian, that's awesome. All right, KT. Well, he needs Ian's it for bid. gargling. Okay. <laughs> we have a bid of $120. <laughs> do I hear a bit of $125? Ian's bid $125. $125. One twenty. No, Felix. Hey, Quiet all right, a new bidder in. Nice, Felix. Felix Massey, wonderful. Uh, so we have a bid of one twenty-five for this incredible bottle of wine. Um, Felix Massey, one twenty-five. Do I hear a bit of one thirty? One thirty. It's a fabulous bottle of wine. I'll do one thirty. Oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Ian. We have a bit of 130 from Ian. I can't wait for my next doula appointment with Ian. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bit of 130. Do I have hear a bit of 135? 135. This is a tax deduction, right? I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the annual fund. We have a bit okay, of 135. Oh, Susan. KT. Susan. Yes. 150. Oh, All right. Felix, you're a doll, Felix. One fifty. Okay. <coughs> That's incredible. Felix Massey's bid one fifty. Do we have a bit of one fifty five? We have a bit of one fifty for this incredible two thousand twelve bottle of wine. You know, Felix, you just made Dave work another five years. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bit of well. one fifty. Do we have a bit of one fifty five? Former District Governor Felix Massey bid 150. 150 going once. We're looking for a bid of 155. 150 going twice. Okay, 155. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, KT. Way to go. Way to go. All right, KT's at 155. Do I have a bit of 160? No. <laughs> Come on, Felix. Give into the peer pressure. Keep spending Dave's money. <laughs> we have a bit of 155. Do we have a bit right. of 160? This, this is it. 175. 175. Ooh, wow, that's incredible, Felix. Your, you your so son was yeah, crunching and went under the table. <laughs> <laughs> we have a you, Felix. $175. Well done. I'm out now. <laughs> yeah. So 175, we, do we have a bit of 180? We have a bit of 175 from Felix Massey going once. 175 going twice. Last chance, 175. 
So old to Felix Massey. Right. Yeah. Great job. That's Thank awesome. you, Susan. Thank you, Felix. Absolutely. That's One, incredible. Wonderful. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, guys. That's that's great. That money One is well going to go in to do some great projects with our uh, local community. All right. Thank you very much, Susan, for that. Uh, let's go uh, to Paul Dryman for Happy Dollars. Okay. I figured what uh, I would do with this is um, because there's three different screens, it's really hard to see who's raising their hand. So if you uh, would kindly go to the bottom of your uh, screen and uh, do the chat and let me know uh, that you would like to uh, do a happy dollar and tell me how much and what your happy dollar is. Go to the chat. Jeff Bornstein looks like he has his hand up. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, $20 because uh, for, for Barbara Massey, who snuck in back there, and that the bottle of wine is actually for her. So uh, <laughs> she didn't even kick me under the table. <laughs> I see Trevor's hand up, Paul. I have five happy dollars that my couches that are stacked up next to my car did not fall over in the earthquake this morning. Earthquakes. All right. How much was that? That is five. Five. Okay. So no one's using the, the chat, so I can't see the, the hands coming up. There we go. Uh, got Nate. I see Nate. Nate has his hand up, yep. Paul. Yep. Yep. I just called on him. Okay. I have uh, 48 happy dollars. Uh, Shirley wow. and I just celebrated our 48th anniversary last oh. night. Oh, yay. That's great. It was it was interesting being isolated here at University Village. Well, you... <laughs> oh, I can do so much with that comment. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Who else would like to do a happy uh, happy announcement? All right. Thank you very much, Paul, for doing happy dollars. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Jason to introduce our uh, speaker for today. So Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can unmute. <coughs> All right. Can everyone hear me? Today, mm -hmm. we've actually got a pretty special speaker. We've got our own Dr. Victor Hayek who is the Deputy Superintendent for the Conejo Valley Unified School District. He's gonna let us know a little bit how they're gonna be handling COVID. Uh, he oversees all district finance and operations for 18,000 plus students and over 2,200 staff across 27 schools. Prior to uh, coming to the Conejo Valley, Dr. Hayek relocated from New Jersey where he served as Superintendent of Schools for two high performing school districts. Victor additionally served his community as a police officer and was subsequently elected to the local board of education where he also served as a president. He taught college courses for 11 years, focusing on business management, operations, and finance. He holds a doctorate from Seton Hall University and both an MBA in finance and bachelor of science in business management from William Patterson University. And most recently, he has authored his first book, Outclass, how to ace the lessons of life and graduate with honors. And now, without any further ado, Dr. Victor Hayek. Thanks, Jason. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, it's great to see everybody. Um, and it's really great to hear and, and see the optimism in, in everybody's voice and our communications here. This is a tough time for everybody, I'm sure, um, not just us in the in the school district. I'll just say uh, I mentioned, you know, so I, I have this on the top of all my, my director's agendas now. It's a quote by Simon Sinek. If uh, any of you know who he is, he's an author and speaks a lot about motivation. Um, his quote is, uh, optimism is not a denial of the current. I think one of the, uh, one of the things that sometimes we endure is, is people have mixed uh, opinions about what is going on and, and how things should, should be handled. And uh, I'll just say that we, we try to remain as optimistic as possible here in the, in the school district as we, we try and, and weather the, the current pandemic and um, how to best continue the delivery of education to all of our students in, in the community. And we recognize full well that 
you know, what we do and the decisions we make, you know, really affect so many different households. You know, in addition to education, you know, we have childcare programs, we have adult ed programs. And, you know, a lot of this is going to affect people's ability to go back to work and in what capacity they go, go back to work if their children are not, not in school uh, live. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about where we are today, but I just want to give a, a, a little bit of a, a story of, of how we got here and really go over the, the roller coaster ride that, that we've had, uh, I would say, January, um, pretty much, is, is when uh, at the time in, in January, you know, we were, we were looking at a pretty positive economic forecast uh, here for the school district. We, we put our budget together starting in, in February, March, uh, and April, and then we bring it to the Board of Education in, in June for formal adoption. And when we did our first draft of the budget in February, we had a pretty positive outlook. Uh, things were, were, were looking pretty well. The district does operate with a budget deficit. Um, that's due to ongoing years of, of being short funded and the ups and downs of, of school district funding. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, so when we put that budget together and then March 13th came and then all of a sudden everything went out the window. We, we ended up closing schools without, you know, any idea of how long it's going to be or when we're going to reopen and when kids are going to be back. Um, so we were kind of in a, in a tough position of, of trying to manage as best as possible without knowing what the, what the future outcome is going to be, which, you know, I, uh, ironically is exactly where we still are today uh, somewhat. One of the things we really tried to do early on is, is really gauge uh, the, uh, get contact with all of our families and, and our students. And this is, a, this is a snapshot. This is going back to, you know, if you think of, we shut schools down, uh, we announced it on Friday, March 13th. Um, and then by April 9th, you know, we had out of the 18,300 plus students that we have in our district, we made no contact and contact without engagement for only 251 students, which was pretty good. By May 4th, the, that total dropped down to 56, and then May 8th, uh, 11, 11 students. So I think we did pretty good in, in reaching out and, and establishing contact with our students. Uh, we, we did the best we can to deliver uh, in a moment's notice, something that we're not built for, which is remote education. Um, and you know there there's some some pros and cons and some criticisms and some accolades and how we handled what we handled, but um, we really tried to 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 put ourselves in a position quickly in order to uh, continue delivery of some type of of remote education. You know one of the things we do as a school district, uh, you may or may not know, is uh, twenty seven percent of our overall student population is uh, qualifies for free reduced meals. So we felt that we had an obligation to somehow, with schools closed, continue to deliver meals to, to students that, that needed them. So we, what we did was we set up a mobile delivery service uh, for, for uh, delivering breakfast and lunches to students. Uh, we did follow all safety protocols. As you can see here, we, we set up uh, lines at our campuses. We made sure everything was disinfected and sanitized. Uh, we, we started out with an assessment of the number of students, where we're going to distribute, uh, what kind of equipment we need, and the, the staff that was required to, to be able to pull this off. So we put our menus together, we scheduled staff, and uh, we do have a central kitchen where we prepare all these meals. So we set up an assembly line at a central kitchen to put together breakfast and lunch uh, in grab-and-go bags that we'd be able to distribute out uh, through our community. And initially we were giving them out to um, only our students and students who qualified, but over uh, a, couple of, a couple of weeks, we started handing them out to any student that, or any child that came to any of our pickup locations that we had throughout the city. So when we announced on March 12th, um, we, we have uh, two schools here that are considered Title I schools, meaning that they have the highest level of soci uh, students that are impacted socioeconomically. Um, but what we did was we applied to the California Department of Education for a waiver to be able to provide meals at more than just those two schools. So we started at eight mo mobile sites and, and the, the California Department of Ed and the 
uh, Federal Ag Agriculture Department approved our request within one hour and we set that up uh, pretty quickly. So we notified our child nutrition staff. We started to prepare and distribute the meals. We created a rotating schedule because you know, we're thinking about our, our students, but we're also thinking about our staff working in a, in a safe environment as well. And uh, so we created an, an opportunity for them to rotate their shifts. Um, some, some, some of our uh, staff work two days, some work three days, but uh, throughout the, the, the course and, and still to this day, we, we've allowed them to rotate and, and be flexible with schedules, keeping in mind that a number of us have, have their own children at home and, and other um, maybe older loved ones that they, they have to take care of. So this is uh, some of the, this is just an example, some of the, the, the meals that we handed out. Uh, they always include a sandwich, a milk, fruit and or vegetables and a bag of chips. Everything is in compliance with the national school regulations. And we set up these drive-through pickups at, at our schools. Uh, again, we, we had, nobody got out of their cars. Uh, we handed them out through the windows. Our staff, you know, always had gloves and masks on. Um, and we didn't check IDs. We didn't ask people for residency requirements. If, if somebody came looking and they, they needed meals, we, we handed them out. This is some of our uh, staff and you could see how, you know, we were putting stuff together. We started work at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning every day. We still do to this day, um, putting together uh, two meals in every bag, which is a, a lunch for today and then a breakfast for the following morning. So we started out with eight locations. Uh, we expanded that out to uh, over 12 locations. Uh, you, you can see here all the places. In addition to our school sites, we went to a lot of the apartment complexes in Thousand Oaks and we distributed meals uh, at each of those locations as well. Now the next phase of, of what, we, what we had to do was uh, in, in order to continue uh, education, we have a, a number of students that don't have access to technology devices. So we, we in the district have over 10,000 Chromebooks. Chromebooks are the small laptop computers that, that are, are based off of a Google platform that many of our students use in our schools. We took a complete inventory. We collected all the, uh, as many devices as we could in a short period of time from all of our campuses. And then we created a loaner program and we started to deploy the technology devices um, starting on March 16th, which was the, the first day that we were closed. So our plan was to have about 4,200 Chromebooks ready by that first day. Uh, we were able to have just under 6,000 devices ready for the first week of distribution. Uh, and you know, we worked uh, probably through, uh, I'm gonna say 18 to 20 hours over the weekend before to ensure that we were ready Monday morning to, to put, Chromebooks in the hands of, of our students. Again, everybody followed the, the social distancing and, and wearing the masks and gloves protocols. You could see on the picture here on the bottom, this is how we have our, our Chromebooks. They're all in carts that sit at our schools. And it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to disassemble each cart because of the way the wirings are put on because these are all charging stations as well. So we collected as much as we could. We, we put them in our trucks and vans that we had, brought them to one central location at each of the, one location at each school. And then we started to take them apart. We, we, sanitized, we cleaned and sanitized each of the Chromebooks and we got them ready for, for distribution. So in the first week, uh, we distributed just under 3000 Chromebooks across 25 of our school sites. Uh, so we had our, our, our librarians and our, our uh, media technicians help us. And so to date, uh, in the, we've checked out just, just over 4,000 Chromebooks, uh, most of them being given out in the first, first week that we did. So we also have a number of stu uh, hotspots that we handed out to families. Uh, tech uh, access to internet is still a challenge for a lot of families in our, in our community. So we we went out and we purchased 1,000 hotspots from Verizon. And we programmed those hotspots. Uh, the school is absorbing the cost of, of the, the charges for data on those hotspots. And any student or family that, doesn't, that didn't have access to the internet, we issued them a hotspot uh, to, in order for them to be able to access the, the, the internet. Again, the same as like we, we did with child nutrition, we, we deployed the devices in a, in a structured format following social distancing and uh, personal protective uh, gear for, for our staff. Uh, everything was clean, sanitized, and we hand this stuff out through a, a, a drive-through type of uh, distribution. 
Now, once we handed them out, we we knew right away we were gonna we were gonna get uh, we were gonna have a responsibility to support those uh, th those devices and, and help students when when they're at home and even parents uh, with with technology, whether they be hardware or software issues. So we set up a, a virtual help desk system, so students can and parents can go in and put in a, a help desk ticket. Uh, they can, we set up a call hotline with uh, three different phone numbers where parents or students can call in for, uh, for support. And we also set up a chat uh, system where uh, if they were online already, but they were having some issues with software, they'd be able to chat with one of our site technicians um, in order to get, to get support. And we have this still ongoing to, to this day to, to help our students. So I talked a little bit about internet access. We initially, we had about 133 families that were in need of internet access when schools closed. Uh, 65 uh, of those families, we were able to connect with Spectrum. Spectrum had an initial, um, I don't wanna say a promotion, but a response to COVID-19 where they gave 60 days of free internet access to families who, who needed them. So we, we connected our families with Spectrum and, and had them enroll in, in that free uh, 60 days. Uh, we followed up thereafter and, and any families who couldn't continue the payments after the 60 days, we issued them hotspots. Um, and we, again, we make connections with as, as many of our families as, as possible. And we still on a as needed basis, we have our um, distribution uh, channel still open for any student who needs either a device or uh, a hotspot for internet. One of the, the things we thought about too is uh, for, for families that maybe didn't want to pick up a hotspot or didn't want that responsibility or for whatever reason, we, we went out to all of our school sites and we did our, our Wi-Fi, um, did a Wi-Fi study outside in our parking lots and because we had some folks actually ask for this. And so we went out and we identified the areas in our parking lots at the schools that access the district's Wi-Fi network um, without being on campus. So what we did was we went and we painted these logos at any of the parking spots that, that had reliable access off of the district's um, wireless access points that were installed in the schools. Operationally, uh, we, you know, we've been following all the recommendations from the, uh, from the county, from CDC, from our own Ventura County School Self-Funding Authority. We created a COVID-19 supply list for all of our school sites. Um, disinfectant, wipe gloves, face masks, hand sanitizers. Cal OES through the, the County Office of Education supplied schools with a 90 day supply of personal protective gear, which were masks for adults and students, um, some hand sanitizers, some face shields um, and some uh, gloves. So that, that was enough to uh, get us started. And we stocked all that in our, in our central warehouse and we put them in our warehouse catalog for school sites to be able to order as they needed uh, if, if when we reach the point of, of opening schools. On the maintenance side, uh, if you look on the, the bottom right of, of this slide here, this is a, it says protects a disinfecting system. So this is a electrostatic sprayer that gives us the ability to, to uh, spray down and disinfect the classroom in just about five minutes. So the solution that, that we use in, in this system here um, is sprayed throughout the classrooms on, in all high touch surfaces. Uh, it takes only a few minutes, but then we let it sit for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then um, it is acceptable from the CDC uh, as, uh, as, a, as a treatment for, for coronavirus to, to kill that virus. So they, that, that piece of equipment is really pivotal in us in looking at our ability to open school in order to be able to do the disinfecting between classes or between cohorts. We also ordered some countertop screens for, for our, uh, our offices um, to, to give additional protection for staff that are interacting with uh, public and parents who come in for registration or paperwork or other types of activities that uh, they have to come into our school sites. And we're following all the same safety protocols as I'm sure everybody else is. Um, one of the things here is that we're doing on the ventilation side, we've ordered uh, all um, high grade uh, filters, replacing all of the filters in our HVAC systems. And we've set up regular replacements of those filters to ensure that there's proper air circulation to all of our classrooms. Uh, California law states that we have to have uh, a flow of fresh air in our classrooms at, at all times when students are there. So in addition to heat and air condition, 
regular outside fresh air is, is piped in and out of the classrooms uh, all day when students are, are on campus. We also set up training for each of our employees. We, we set up online training modules, figured that the, that's the most efficient way to, to do it. Uh, we've had all of our maintenance and operational staff completed that, uh, that training and we're, we're moving forward with our, our instructional staff and, and other staff that, that's on campus to complete that training before uh, such time comes as where we start the school. Now, meanwhile, from, from January, uh, what, what, what happened uh, is, you know, as we all know, the economy really took a, took a, took a turn uh, in January. The governor proposed, this is our timeline that we work for, for our budget for the school district. In January, the governor proposes his initial budget and then we start to put our, our budget together in February through, through April. In March, we reported our, a favorable outlook from our finances. Uh, we, we, haven't, we hadn't made the decision yet to, to close down and the virus wasn't impacting the state as much as um, it is now. On March 13th, we initiated the, the shutdown of schools. And then in May, by the time the governor uh, came and revised his budget forecast for the following year, we went from in a matter of, of three or four months of having a positive economic outlook to looking at a scenario where we were losing just over $14 million of funding in one year out of 100 and, um, 160, 000, $160 million a year that we get funding from the state. So it left us uh, just about nine days to look at ways to cut $14 million before we had to present the, our budget to the board in, in June. The board acted quickly um, and we pushed that timeline forward. Uh, our last day to actually present the, and adopt the budget is June 30th. So the board set up a, a, a public board meeting every Tuesday in June in order for us to get as much information as possible and give us as much information as possible to, uh, to, to really work through the, the pandemic. This is just a, a, a slide of the, uh, the state's general fund revenues. Uh, the, the states, uh, what you see in the green line is where we were in January and then where, where the, the revised budget expectations came out in, in May. Uh, the state gets its, its revenue sources from what's called the big three, which are personal income tax, sales and use tax, and then corporate tax. So uh, you can see we were looking at a pretty positive forecast uh, in the green line in January and then where we are now uh, in, in May and what the, what the proposed budget is for the following year really put us in a, in a difficult situation. And the reason, of the reason that is is because 88% uh, of the district's revenue is received from the state. So we're heavily impacted by the economics of, of the state because as, as you see, 71% of the revenue that the state collects is from those big three sources. And the school funding uh, proposition is called Prop 98. It guarantees a percentage of those revenues for education. So as those, re you, you, you can do the math, as the revenues increase, then we would, we, we would theoretically get more money. So as revenues decrease, we would take a hit in money. And this is the exact situation that we are in since the state revenue took a hit so that it would trickle down to how, how much funding that the state would give, would give schools. You hear the acronym LCFF, which is our local control funding formula. Uh, that's the total amount of state aid that state dollars that we get to, to fund schools in, in, in the Conejo Valley here. And it's broken up in, in a number of different, different pots. Uh, the first one is the, the base grant. So our base grant was about 156 million and then we get a grade span adjustment. The grade span adjustment is for maintaining smaller class sizes in grades kindergarten through grade two. And then we also get a grade span adjustment for our high school students for career technical education. And then the next piece of that is about 8.5 million. That's our supplemental grant. Our supplemental grant is for uh, what, what's termed as unduplicated pupil count. And that involves our English learners, low income, foster youth and our homeless students, which I noted earlier is about 27% of our overall student population. And then there's a, a, an additional small portion for uh, home to school transportation and then some targeted instructional improvements. So this is the, the overall total of, of how, how our breakdown of the, the dollars that we get from the state that go to education. 
If you look at the column here for 2019-20 second interim, that, that was based upon the, the governor's January budget proposal. We were looking at $193 million in total revenue. And then by the time May came around, that dropped down to about $178 million. So, was, so we were looking at making an adjustment of, uh, again, $15.5 million in a short period of time from, from where we were just months ago. As you can imagine, it's, it's extremely difficult uh, to, to, to cut $15 million in, in a budget when 83% of our expenses are all related to staffing. So on the, left, on the left pie here, you can see we have certificated staff, classified staff, and our benefit costs related to staffing totals 83% of all, of 83 cents of every dollar that we spend. On the right side, the LCFF, which is the state dollars that we get, represent 82%, 82 cents of every dollar that, that we receive. So we knew if we were in a position to have to cut $15 million, it required significant staffing cuts that we would have to do, which would directly impact the, the programs, class size, and other things that, um, that we really cherish here for, for our kids. So in a short period of time, we looked at, and I'll go through these quickly, we, we looked at a number of a different scenarios of, of how, to, how to cut. We looked at making cuts over a period of time, 7 million, 12 million, 6 million over three years. Then we looked at trying to even them out at eight and a half each year. Then we looked at what if we cut the most up front and then it would minimize later on. So we went through a multitude of different scenarios on, on how, to, how to work uh, within the, the, the budget cuts that we had. And then in the end, what happened was the, the governor and the legislature came to an agreement where uh, they, they, they funded us at the same level as they did the prior year, eliminating our, the necessity for us to cut $15 million. Um, but what they, how they did it was through a, what, what they termed as deferrals. So meaning that they're telling us they're giving us the money in February, March, April, May, and June of 2021, but we're not actually getting the cash until the following year. So those of us that, that own businesses and, and, and know and even manage our finances at home, you know, we could put down on paper that we're getting $10, but until we get that $10 cash, we can't use it. So that put the district in a position to have to borrow money. So if the deferrals hold and there is no additional federal stimulus dollars, the district will have to go out for a short-term loan of somewhere between 20 and $25 million. On a positive note, they did allocate some stimulus funds to the school district that we are using uh, for loss learning. And what we're trying to do is, is help work with our teachers to provide them the appropriate development that they need to ensure that uh, we're addressing the lost learning that we, our students have experienced since the closure and to help us assist uh, getting school open in the, uh, in the next few months, hopefully. Uh, Victor, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Uh, this is a great presentation. We're running a little short on time, so I'm going to uh, recommend that if um, people have uh, questions, that you, if Victor, do you have a, a, will you be able to stay on maybe a couple extra minutes past our meeting time to answer sure. any questions? That sure. would be fantastic. So we will we will keep the uh, the Zoom meeting open for uh, any questions afterwards. Um, but I know some of you have to get off. Uh, we're getting close to our end time. Victor, I want to thank you for a really great presentation. This was very enlightening on what's going on in our local school district. Um, we will normally have you sign a book that would go to one of our Title I schools, but since you're not with us live, we will sign your name, put your name in a book that will go to a Title I school that we do for every speaker as a, a small thank you for taking all your time and putting all your effort into being here today. And it's great seeing you back at our club. So, so welcome and thank you for that. I want to thank uh, um, our Carol Freeman for announcing our, our guests. For Paul Dryman doing happy dollars, Patricia Jones taking notes, for the inspiration and pledge, I want to thank Heather, Fine Session KT, great auction by Susan, great money, good job, and our fun time manager, Mr. Pat McCoy and Vanna, thank you for all of your efforts. So just a reminder as we close off today, just when the caterpillar thought that the world was ending, he turned into a butterfly. 
So let's go forth, Rotarians. Let's change the world. And that's all there is for this July 30th, 2020. <laughs> Stay on the line for some additional questions to Victor if you want to do that. All right, so we have anybody that has a question for Victor? I do, this is Chris. All right, Chris, go ahead. Um, Victor, maybe you covered it and I was spaced out, I don't know, but um, I know that, um, I guess the schools are gonna start um, remotely again, right, in the fall, is that correct? Yeah, so the, the latest direction that we've received is that because the county is still on the watch list, we, we have to open up in a remote setting. So the trigger to change that is the county has to be uh, 14 days in a decline of, of reported cases um, or just some, some measure that the county uses. So we're not there yet. Now we're still a good three weeks away from the opening of school. So we're preparing for two scenarios. We're preparing to, do, to be remote, which is where we are today, but should the 14 day window change between now and the start of school, we're ready to pivot and, and implement a, a, a phased in entry approach where we do have students on campus. Okay, so, but it wouldn't be like all the kids all at the same time, would it be kind of phased as far as like a combination or how, how are you gonna do that? <laughs> <laughs> just full on open. <laughs> yeah, so let, let, me, let me show you this uh, quickly. Uh, so this is a sample middle school schedule. So what we essentially did was in order to comply with social distancing right. um, and the students and staff will have to follow the guidelines of wearing masks and such, but we split the schools into two cohorts. So there'll be half day sessions. So we're gonna have uh, half the school come in cohort A and half the school come in cohort B. So what that means is you're gonna have, let's say, uh, I'll say Los Cerritos Middle School has 1,000 students. So we have 500 students on campus in the morning. Then we mm -hmm. have a 90 minute break where we clean and sanitize. Then we have the, the, the other 500 students come in in the afternoon for the same classes. And then we would repeat that every, every day. So it's a half mm -hmm. of a day at school phased in until we get to a point that we're able to um, accommodate every student within um, whether there be a vaccine or they relax the social distancing guidelines. Wow. That's just amazing. I, I'm, oh, I'm glad I don't have little kids in school anymore. <laughs> That's and we all did I got to say. We did the same thing at the, at the high school here. You can see a similar type of schedule, cohort mm -hmm. A and cohort B. Um, and we did the same thing in the elementaries, um, same thing. And we structured the time. You know, one of the things we really tried to do was to um, handle the social emotional uh, welfare of students. So we did allocate time in, in each of our schedules to be able to do that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Victor, I have a question from Adam Antoniscus. Um, he was asking if you don't get, you know, if you don't start in the start time in a couple of weeks after Ventura County gets off the state watch list and public private schools are allowed to reopen, how long would it take you to get kids back in the classroom? We're, we're prepared to pivot pretty quickly, um, probably within within a couple of days. So we've been preparing for this split AB uh, type of schedule and with students in the cohorts. So we're prepared to move on that today if we had to. We're gonna go to remote, but we would have to look at the, the time. You know, we if we're close to the end of the, the first marking period, then, you know, we may wanna wait a week and just close out that first marking period, then open up live at the second, just, um, depending on where we are in a year, but we are ready to pivot relatively quickly. Great. Bob, you have hey, a Victor, question. Hey, quick, quick follow up to that one. So there you're phasing in and you're doing, so for instance, elementary kindergarten through third will be the first tranche that goes back. How long after that will the fourth and fifth graders, uh, will it be before they get to go back? It, it would be, so the, the phased in is, is not by grade level. The phase in is everyone K-12 goes back for half of a day. Then the next phase, we, we increase the, uh, how much time that they, they spend on campus. So let me, let me show you um, our, our phases uh, quickly. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of trying to get as many students back on campus at the, uh, as, at the same time as much as possible. So here's an here's a illustration of, of what our phases look like. So in phase one, where, where we are right now, so it's essential, essential services only. We're doing 100% remote learning. 
And then phase two, we do the soft, soft opening where we're doing the AM, PM cohorts. Um, and then phase three, uh, we, we increase the, the number of time in com campus. And then phase four, essentially we go back to traditional where everybody is on campus as, as normal. But throughout the whole process, we are giving parents the option that if they don't feel, feel it's safe or they don't want their children going back, we do have options for uh, parents to, to stay in 100% remote learning all year, whether we're in phase one, two, three, or four. Um, and we have uh, options for hybrid as well throughout the whole year at the same time also. Victor, this is Nate. Uh, um, so the teachers stay in the room and get the half the class in the morning and half the class in the afternoon? Yeah, that, that, that would be the idea. Okay. So the teachers would be, would be there. They would get, so if I'm an elementary fourth grade teacher, I have, let's say 25 kids. I have 12 of my kids come in in the morning. Then I, there's 90 minutes where, where I go to lunch and do some prep and, and come out of my classroom. We would go in and we would clean and sanitize. And then at 1230, my, my next group of 13 kids would come in in the afternoon. Okay. So the kids are still able to, to socially commingle, um, but on a limited basis. Got it, got it. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you had a question. Yeah, Victor, I'm, I'm concerned about, uh, particularly among the younger children, a, a generation of really being permanently behind, losing education. I can relate to high school kids doing distance learning. Um, there's going to be some that are going to flake off and the, or their parents don't give a hoot, but I can relate to that. I can kind of relate to middle school, maybe, but you come down to first, second, third, maybe even fourth graders. They're not going to sit in front of a computer that long. They, the kids can't do it. And they're not and trying to teach somebody to read or math in, in off distance is, it's just not realistic. <coughs> so how are, when we can get the kids back, I mean, I know we can't right now, how are we going to catch them up other than adding a year to their school schedule? Yeah. You know, we, I think we all, we all agree with you. And I certainly agree with you as a parent. I have a, I have three children. I have one in elementary, one in middle and one in high school. And I've got a grandchild that's in first, uh, just leaving first grade. He, he lost the whole ha ha last half of his year in, in second grade. I mean, he's not learning anything. Yeah. So when, as we prepare now for the beginning of the, the school year, we've been having conversations with, with our teachers about, you know, the, the re-entry into school and using the, the first few weeks of school to really, it not so much remediate, but to, to ha they, they have to, one, ensure the, the, the social, emotional well-being of, of the students. There needs to be that conversation to get them back to, you know, being um, comfortable in, in school again, and then having them talk out loud about some of their experiences and, and, and share their experiences. And then there's gonna have to be a spiraling of the, the, the curriculum that essentially was missed at the end of last year to how we're gonna integrate that into this year's curriculum and spiral it in together. So, uh, you know, there are no easy answers and, and you know, we'd stop short of guaranteeing anything. This is not an ideal situation, but we, we, we are planning on looking at our, our pacing guides for each of our classes. So if you're going from, from um, third grade to fourth grade, yeah, there's gonna be some stuff in the fourth grade that you know, we're, we're not going to cover because we're gonna to have to cover some of the stuff that was missed in, in third grade. But our teachers are, and we're working with them on is, is really to, to take some of those, those building blocks that are necessary in third grade that you need in fourth grade and to weave them in into those fourth grade lessons as they go along, rather than just assume, all right, the kids know how to do long division. So uh, we're gonna pick up here, you know, with, with a, a higher level of long division. No, they're gonna start at the lower level of long division and then build up gradually to ensure that the students are understanding. One of the, the benefits that, you know, in doing the, the soft opening with the cohorts is you know, a teacher has the ability to focus a, a little bit more on the students because instead of having 25 students in the class, you may have only 10 or 12. Right. And you may yeah. have even less because some families have already opted out for remote learning um, or a hybrid where they're, they don't want to send their kids to school. So um, the, the complete remote is, is challenging. And, and I agree with you. My, my seven-year-old won't sit in front of the screen for, for more than 10 minutes before he loses interest. So you know, that is something that we're really trying to work through. Um, 
and you know i we don't have all the answers yet right now but we're we're, we're doing our best to put put things in place to to try to ensure that students are engaged even if it means we're calling students at home talking to parents providing support from three o'clock till eight o'clock at night providing things outside of that that regular time um, and being live as as much as we can in person more so than just you know, here's a website, go do this, you know, these pieces of math or English or whatever it is, where our expectations is that teachers are live during the time where the students are in front of the screen. So they, are, they will be able to converse and have a conversation with the teachers and with the other students in the class. Thank you, Victor. Do we have just a final question before I have a, let Victor go? I have Who a I have? Oh yes, Felix, go ahead. The, uh, the question that comes to my mind, since nothing is normal anymore, uh, what happens with these parents that have a different work schedule now and the kids have a different school set schedule? How do you put those together? Yeah, that, that, that is a challenge for, for everybody. And I don't know if, if who you may or may not know, but you know, we have our own child care program that we operate in Conejo Valley. And we, we've been having overwhelming demand for, for childcare, even in the, remote, uh, in the remote setting, if we don't open and the kids are 100% uh, out of school, we are planning to offer childcare during the day from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. to help families and parents. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have some overwhelming demand on that and we're gonna have to wait and see when, when the schedules are finalized, but we are, gonna, we are in a position to accommodate um, working families to provide childcare services during during the day. We're just waiting for clearance from the county health department to, for us to be able to do that. How's that going to work with parents that uh, are on the low level as far as income is concerned and yet are on a lower level because they're only going to work part-time? Yeah, we, we do have uh, at two of our elementary schools, we have uh, state-run preschools and we have state-run programs as well. So any, any uh, um, families that, have, that, that uh, struggle socioeconomically, um, there are some avenues out there that are um, available to them. And also there are other uh, third party organizations that are providing childcare services and do it on a scholarship basis based on need as well. Thank you, Victor. Great, thank you, Victor. That was, that was a great you, presentation. And uh, really good. You know, if there's ways that our club can partner with you um as what you're doing why well, please uh, talk to us about that as a club member we'd love to also partner with you and what you're doing because it's a big task it's pretty clear you've got an overwhelming job right now and greatly appreciated of all the things that you are doing in our community to make a difference and to get kids back to school so appreciate your time today thank you so much and thanks everybody for being on, we will see you soon at a coffee or a social hour or next Thursday. Thank so you. So everybody have a great week. Thanks, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.